Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We'll get started in just a moment. I can start as soon as we have slides ready. Hello, everyone. Uh, as people are joining, I'm just going to get started with our introduction. Um, thank you so much for being here this afternoon. My name is uh, Teresa Sweetland. I'm the executive director of Forecast Public Art and the publisher of Forward. And just thrilled to have you here today for this conversation, Art, Design and Justice with Joseph Kunkel, Angela Two Stars and Jeremy Liu. Um, I want to start by just respectfully acknowledging the sacred land upon which I'm joining this event. Today, I'm based in Minneapolis, Minnesota, which is the traditional land of the Dakota Ayote, which was unfair, unfairly ceded in the treaties of 1837 and 1851, who stewarded it for millennia. And I, I um, invite you to introduce yourself in the chat, um, share where you're located and the land that you're on. So um, please look forward. I look forward to seeing who's here with us today. Um, today's discussion is hosted by Forecast Public Art, and I'm going to share just a little bit about our work. Mallory, you can advance the slides. So Forecast is a nonprofit organization. We are based in the Twin Cities and we work nationally. And we have a mission that activates, inspires, and advocates for public art that advances justice, health, and human dignity. And this is a new mission, but work that we've been doing for over 40 years here and across the country. And our team works um, with communities and with artists to support more equitable places everywhere around um, the country. You could advance the slide, Mallory, from um, Red Wing, Minnesota, to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, to Waco, Texas, many, many other places. You can see here um, our work continues to grow nationally. Uh, next slide, please. And we're a team of artists, practitioners, architects, planners, designers, facilitators, educators, many, many more uh, names to add to that list. Um, who are deeply committed to this work around justice, racial justice, indigenous visibility and in more equitable places. And we have five main areas of work um, and you can go to the next slide, Mallory. Um, our core area is create our creative studio. We were founded by a group of artists who wanted more opportunities to work in public. And this has been core to our work for over four decades supporting artists with tools, resources, and funding to advance their work, specifically to work in public space. Next slide, please. And we've expanded because spaces are not always conducive to working with artists. We have expanded our work to planning and engagement. And this takes us to connecting decision makers, policy makers, planners, engineers, work um, across sector with artists and creative strategies to make more equitable and accessible places. This may look like a public art master plan to a mapping um, process to a policy change. Next slide, please. We also do training, um, customized training and um, facilitation fellowships, both in person online for this kind of work to build capacity for people to do this on their own. Next slide, please. And because we know that change happens within systems, we've just recently launched our change lab and this works to disrupt the public art status quo to advance more equitable public art policy nationwide through fellowships, new research, uh, conferences and gatherings. And finally, <laughs> um, 
we publish and share stories. Uh, this is really the launching pad for our conversation today, which is our series, our publication series and conversation series called Forward. We launched this during the pandemic in 2020 as a way to bring attention to and value to the role that artists and arts and culture has in partnering across sectors to address the most vital issues of our time. We have um, published issues on transportation, public health, community safety, um, this issue we're talking about today um, around design and sustainability in Indian country, and our next issue will be around housing coming out later this year. And in everything we do, uh, we're working with and towards efforts to bring justice to Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities and ensure efforts come from communities that are most impacted by the work in any place. Um, and that looks like robust listening sessions, community engagement, um, and other efforts that are essential um, to our work in, in any partnership and engagement that we're, that we're working on. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. <laughs> so this current issue um, that we're talking about today, um, I'm thrilled about, came from a um, conversation with Joseph Kunkel about um, his work and the work of the Sustainable Native Communities Collaborative um, through Mass Design and how that interacts with our goals around bringing attention to artists and more equitable, sustainable places. And so I'm going to hand it over to Mallory Roxana Nazem to introduce our speakers today and get started on our conversation. Mallory is our forward curator of partnerships and programming. So thank you for being here and excited for the conversation. I'm so excited for today's conversation. Thanks, Teresa, for sharing a bit about Forecast Public Art and our forward publication and conversation series. Um, I've been lucky to take a part, take part in all of them, uh, from the public health issue to transportation. I guest edited our community safety issue and this issue on redefining sustainable design in Indian country was guest edited by one of our panelists today, Joseph Kunkel. Um, the lead essayist for this publication was Jeremy Liu, who's also one of our panelists. And um, all of this work is inspired by incredible artwork um, and design work by public artists and designers like Angela Two Stars, who is our third panelist today. So really excited to talk about all things art, design, and justice today. I'm gonna introduce you all to our panelists and share my screen. Right, so today you are joined by Joseph Kunkel, who is a citizen of the Northern Cheyenne Nation, director of Mass Design Group's Sustainable Native Communities Design Lab based in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And as a community designer and educator, Joseph's work explores how architecture, planning, and construction can be leveraged to positively impact the built and unbuilt environments within Indian country. In 2019, Joseph was awarded an Obama Fellowship for his work with Indigenous communities. He also received a 2018 Rauschenberg Seed Grant from the Rauschenberg Foundation and 2019 a Creative Capital Award. He's a fellow of the inaugural class of the Civil Society Fellowship, which is a partner of ADL and the Aspen Institute and is a member of the Aspen Global Leadership Network. Most recently, Joseph was awarded the 2021 inaugural Elaine Johnson Coates Award by the University of Maryland's Alumni Association. So let's give Joseph a warm welcome. Jeremy Liu is our second speaker today. And Jeremy is an experienced mixed use real estate developer and executive with a background in urban and community planning creative placemaking, environmental science, and technology programs. As the Senior Fellow for Arts, Culture, and Equitable Development at PolicyLink, he shaped and guided an initiative integrating arts and culture into equitable development work. 
He is currently manage the managing director at Creative Development Partners, the California-based real estate investment and development company that he co-founded. Welcome, Jeremy. And lastly, um, but definitely not least, is Angela Two Stars. Welcome, Angela. Angela Two Stars is a public artist and curator. She is an enrolled member of the Sisseton Wapiton Oyate and received her BFA from Kendall College of Art and Design in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Angela is the director of All My Relations Arts, which is a contemporary Native American art gallery and arts program that works to highlight the strength and visibility of contemporary Native American artists. This organization is a project of the Native American Community Development Institute in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And Angela's professional arts career began at All My Relations Arts Gallery as an exhibiting artist. And that led to further opportunities, including her first curatorial role for the exhibition entitled Bring Her Home, Stolen Daughters of Turtle Island, a powerful exhibition highlighting an ongoing epidemic of missing and murdered indigenous women. Angela's public art graces the shores of, uh, I do not know how to pronounce this Angela, so I am I apologize, Bidet Makaska, and shares the Dakota language through visual accessibility. Her most recent public art commission is installed at the Minneapolis Sculpture Garden, an acquisition of the Walker Art Center. And Angela's public artworks also include commissions for the city of Minneapolis, the St. Paul Port Authority through a project with Forecast Public Art. And Angela currently lives in St. Paul, Minnesota with her husband and her three children. Welcome, Angela. Thank you all so much, uh, panelists, for joining us today. Um, and thank you all attendees for being here and joining us for this conversation. I'm gonna take my slides off. Um, we have a lot to talk about and we are also going to want your questions. So we would love while we're having this conversation, if anything comes to mind that you wanna know more about or anything that we're not covering, go ahead and drop your questions just directly in the chat and we'll collect them as we go along and we'll ask them at the end. So for now, um, I'm gonna ask my own questions because I have so many things that I wanna know about art design and justice. Um, and this first question is really inspired by the content in the publication. Um, and this question is really for all of you. So feel free to chime in as you feel called to. And the question is, what does it mean in practice? So pra practically on the ground for us to, to decolonize infrastructure projects. So projects in the built environment. What does it mean to, to actively decolonize them? Jeremy, you want to kick us off? Yeah, sorry, hold on. My, yeah, I, um, I think it's really important. It's a great question. I think it's a great starting point. I think it really means starting with our own perceptions of what infrastructure is and how it um, shows up in community. So, you know, I think, you know, the biggest sort of trick is to understand like that infrastructure really is nearly anything in your communities and in our neighborhoods and knowing that that's what's what the broadest terms of what infrastructure means. You know, people tend to think it means like the physical big things like the highways or the big sewer treatment plants or whatnot, but infrastructure really is nearly everything that we encounter every day. And so starting with there is a good place because that's our own internal sense of what it is because we have to even know what um, what is uh, under, um, what's at play when we're talking about infrastructure. Yeah. Happy to chime in again. Yeah, good question. Just trying to kind of maybe think about the context and and what and how we think about infrastructure and what it means geographically and and who is it serving. Uh, I, I'd kind of lift up uh, one one and I think maybe just through example what infrastructure might mean as as it relates to kind of decolonizing or or thinking about who and what it's serving. Uh, a prime example is 
the the Heritage Arch Trail uh, on a on a housing project that we worked on uh, with the Santo Domingo Pueblo. All right, and this is basically just a trail that connects a community to a community, and and so often we take uh, we take infrastructure. I, I would say in, in a Western context, very much for granted. Um, that uh, we have a sidewalk to walk on, or we can get on a subway or, or a transit line. Like that is very much, I would say, taken for granted in an urban context. When it comes to a rural context, how is infrastructure serving or not serving the populations that we're trying to, uh, to support and lift up? Um, and in this case, uh, just having a safe, walkable trail to connect a housing development to the community uh, is is w w what it might mean for uh, for the Santo Domingo community or a Kiowa community to to have access to to infrastructure and then and then ensuring that developments uh, in rural contexts and urban native or urban Indian contexts have access to uh, to these these resources uh, and that it's part of a development budget that it's part of a a plan to to include overall. Uh, yeah, I guess I can chime in just speaking like as an artist working um, within like infrastructure projects within my own public art. Um, and then just from my cultural experience, um, incorporating that into the process, you know, um, the, the piece that I did for the Minneapolis uh, Sculpture Garden, you know, prior to the work being done on the site of my family held a uh, ground cleansing ceremony. And so that was something that was, you know, open to the public. Um, and it was just a, a prelude to prior to my piece being cited at that space, um, like in acknowledgement of what had previously um, been there. And having the ceremony was doing things in a good way uh, that my relatives were a part of. And the same thing, like when the piece opened, it was, again, inviting my relatives, my family, uh, to be part of that event, the the opening, and you know we had um, the Kit Fox Honor Guard that was there carrying the flags in because the piece itself was a uh, you know inspired by my grandfather who was a, a veteran. So these honor guards were wearing their their headdresses and you know they were using medicines within the space and just doing everything like from our cultural in, incorporating our cultural elements into it. So to me, like that was really meaningful that my relatives with from my reservation from my tribe but also here in the twin cities were able to observe how we were incorporating our culture as part of my art piece so that was really valuable to be able to share that with everybody and angela were you were you able to actually write those elements into like a budget proposal and make sure that um you know that that is there's compensation and support for those elements of your work? I think that project itself was a process. You know, I don't think we really knew everything that was needed at the onset of my, you know, being commissioned. So it was through this, its own journey, recognizing this is something that we need to do. Like, this is something that I need to have as a Native artist. Um, because I need to have this done so that it's in a good way before my piece is set here, just knowing what um, that people had been harmed and hurt by the previous piece. And as a as our culture, you know, to be able to hold a ground cleansing ceremony, it was, you know, just bringing that spirituality of our, our people into the space. And it was incorporated along the process as part of the budget, you know, to, to help people with travel and accommodations and you know, to lead that ceremony component, but I don't, it wasn't something that I knew at the beginning that was something that needed to happen. So it was kind of an ongoing work in progress. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like there was enough openness and, and iteration from the folks that you worked with that it was able yes. to be integrated. Yeah, there was support to have that integrated. Yes. That's great. Good morning. Angela, I really appreciate, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I really appreciate you bringing into this conversation the past harms and acknowledging them and being able to really understand and lift up that that's that has to be part of that's another way that we can decolonize infrastructure because you can, 
at minimum, you have to be able to understand the way infrastructure as it's been conceived of in the past has created harms as much as it, you know, the, the, the main idea that it has served some function is also important, but that it, you know, there's, uh, they're not universally positive things in, in, in any infrastructure. And I, I think that's the other thing I would say is that acknowledging, the other thing I would say to start to decolonize infrastructures by acknowledging that maybe the path forward for infrastructure is the, the removal of things as much as it is the creation of things. And I think that's been shown a little bit in this last round, although a very, very in a small way, the, the infrastructure budget has a money in it to think about how you remove the past, uh, remove things that have impacted uh, communities in the past, like highways that have cut through neighborhoods. But even that budget is a tiny, tiny fraction of what the overall infrastructure budget um, is going to be. That that leads me to a question about the what what do you all think uh, the role of design and public art have in as part of a reparative or healing process, where have you seen design and public art repair and heal um, in your own work or witnessing it, even just as a person moving through space anywhere? I can I can share. Um, I had the honor of being able to work with Pangeo World Theater last summer um, on a reparative artwork that was located across from the third precinct in Minneapolis, which is where the site of all of the um, kind of devastation destruction happened after the murder of George Floyd. And I was invited to lead a, a, a temporary art installation on the grounds of the burned of a you know burned uh, liquor store that had formerly been sited there at that corner. And so I was able to create design and create along with a, an architectural group and a construction company uh, bkv and je dunn um, a temporary installation of a cocoon frame and then we hosted a number of community art activities where we invited the community to come and write their hopes and dreams and laments and kind of like mottos of strength to help this community rebuild and heal from what had happened to their neighborhood the year prior so that was just a wonderful way for people to come in together in, in community and be together in this space um, to reflect and also think and think about how they wanted to move forward and, and heal as a collective. And, you know, that was just something that was I saw a, as a way of allowing people who aren't artists to be able to be part of an art process and to be able to be part of something that helped them uh, move forward in in healing. I can kind of dive in, uh, and uh, I think an example, I guess, going uh, back to some of the trail work that we've done, uh, both that the work that has been completed and the work that we're working on now, uh, incorporating and thinking about the voices of the community and whether or not they are artists or or are artists trying to kind of understand what is the role and, and how are they being lift, lifted up in the, the kind of end result. Um, the kind of the Santo Domingo Heritage Art Arch Trail, uh, ensuring that uh, the artists uh, have a voice in the, in the development, the design uh, process uh, uh, in, in the work that we're doing around the Northern Cheyenne Healing Trail uh who who are there the committee are not artists but yet we're working at ways in which the elders uh voices are are seen in the kind of reflection of the of the physical work or the physical trail uh and trying to kind of understand how how their 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 ideas and their histories and their and their stories are being uh, kind of integrated into the overall project um Um, the example I would share is um, uh, uh, there's a place in sort of central California called um, Indian Canyon, where uh, an artist, cultural worker named Amory Dog, uh, Amory Sayer, sorry, um, uh, reclaimed land uh, that had been uh, part of her uh, community for centuries. Um, it, this canyon is actually the one of the sort of um, it feels like 
it could be sort of a, a piece of native owned land, native land that has been protected and not been ever unseated for, for since the time began. And um, but Amory Sayers used the 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 Dawes Act on itself, the Dawes Act, which was the uh, thing that really was the act that allowed the the um, the, the state, the U.S. government, but the state to really uh, tear apart sort of the, one of the core infrastructures in Native communities, which is a collective stewardship of land into individual allotment pieces. And she was able to actually use that as a, as a creative, really, as a cultural worker to, to get, to expand the piece of land that her family had stewarded um, in the Indian Canyon. So she utilized the same act to to go back and so she directly confronted the the um, the sort of land assemblage mainstream notions about how land ought to be uh, conserved and stewarded and that had been imposed on native communities and actually use that as a way to like go back and directly use that to expand this canyons the, the amount of land in this canyon that she could steward for on behalf of native communities. It's always fun to see public artists like directly doing work with policy. It sounds like an amazing project. Um, so Jeremy, I'm gonna use a, a bit of a quote from something you wrote for Forward to open up this next question. So in your lead essay, you talk about bureaucratic racism. That's the term you, that you use. Um, and I'm interested in, in that term and kind of pulling it apart a little bit more. So can, can you share, and then can, can the rest of the panelists also share um, what, what does that term mean to you? Um, and then how can artists and designers help um, to, to change this? <laughs> you know, what is, the, what is the intervention? Yeah, just quick, two, two dimensions I'd say of what I feel are, is what I'm trying to get at by that term is the way um, regulatory and, and policy systems, policies create regulatory frameworks within which you embed uh, racialized notions of either community or homes or society or the way things ought to be. And those get pr promulgated going forward and in a way that turn all uh, efforts directly related to adhering to that regulation into essentially arms or agents of the sort of original sin of sort of the, the um, sort of white supremacist view about the way, you know, people should be living together in homes, which has led to, for example, the, you know, the cap on number of residents per bedroom, which leads to very constrained household sizes, which leads to, you know, different struggles for communities who, who come from cultures that may not actually have household sizes that fit the literally the square box, you know, the neat little box that we think um, homes should be for, you know, the nuclear family. Um, on the other hand, um, there are times when um, seemingly intent uh, uh, policies and regulations with seemingly positive intent, which in, you know, in the right ways actually have done things like protect the environment. So for example, the California Environmental Quality Act which have been since its creation been weaponized by sort of uh, uh, folks who have opposed more housing, for example, as a an excuse, a uh, a socially palatable uh, reason for opposing more housing, as opposed to just coming out right and saying, "Well, we don't want more people like that living near me." And that is the coded sort of language that bureaucracy often is used. And I think both of those things happen when you, you think about bureaucratic racism. So the, the application of um, po you know, policies and regulations, but also the embeddedness of um, sort of really clear biased and um, sort of monocultural perspectives into the policy language itself. And I'd love to hear what Joseph and Angela think about that. Yeah, it's a, it's something to unpack uh, a little bit around around this, uh, and uh, I think even unpacking it further when you talk about bureaucratic racism and and the kind of maybe underlying uh, 
issues around the policies that were, I mean, specifically around, let's just kind of maybe focus quickly on tribal housing. The Dawes Act, which is posted in the chat, uh, ways in which kind of uh, breaking down the community or breaking up the communities of, uh, uh, of, of tribal nations to kind of say, you're, you're, you're trying to kind of meld them into, meld us into this kind of notion around capitalism and, and breaking down the community of like, this is your land now you as a family or you as an individual need to take care of it rather than kind of relying on the social structures of the of the community that were inherent and so that that policy of breaking down but thinking uh, that you're going to lift up in a western in a western context and then kind of moving forward to the 1937 housing act which basically said that you all are all, you all are all the same and so a house that you find in the Southwest is a very similar house that you find in, 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 the, in the Plains. This kind of copy pasting of, uh, of housing typologies across Indian country, uh, again, uh, saying that you're all same, yet we have very distinct ways of thinking about culture, thinking about place, thinking about uh, ways in which we're building, building communities. Uh, and so that again, breaking down, or the, if we fast forward to, the Native American Housing Assistance uh, and Self-Determination Act, NAHASDA, which uh, self-determination in its sense is a great, great kind of movement forward. But if you don't give communities the capacity to allocate funds or think about ways in which we're able to kind of take this work on ourselves, if you don't have the capacities there to build uh, in ways that promote self-determination, the, the end result, again, are, are kind of a negative, negatively impacting our communities. And so just quickly, as it relates to kind of artists and, and, and kind of designers, the way to kind of bring attention to these issues and, and try and lift up the, the inabilities for these policies to really promote justice and human dignity is something that I think is the role of the artist, is the role of the designer to really kind of uh, make the general public more aware of, of the issues facing uh, native, native communities across, across the country. Wow, you guys have really good answers. Um, I guess I was thinking about like bureaucratic racism just as a, from my experience as an artist, um, I think about situations that I've been in where, let's say for example, like you're know, working for a system that you technically are not like an employee of. And so if you experience anything like a, a hostile work environment or you have to file a grievance or you know, um, need to write a complaint, uh, there's no system for you to, it's not shared like how to navigate that type of process. And, and so as artists, you kind of are left vulnerable, uh, especially as an artist of color. Um, I've had, you know, experiences where I call it a, an, an emotional labor that I've had to take on, like through the working in like a bureaucratic racism system as a public artist. And that's something that I just ex have experienced, unfortunately, more than one time. Um, and so those are those kinds of things like, you know, these projects are transactional, um, contractual basis. And, you know, as a starving artist, you're just supposed to be like so thankful for the opportunity. And so if you get ended up treating, being treated like crap or being expected to like stay in your lane as a native artist and only be making native art, because um, that's what you were like brought on to do. And if your art, like my art, um, doesn't look like a screaming, na stereotypical native artwork, um, you know, you're kind of getting called out for those things and those and having to explain your work and educate people about your, your history as native people. Um, I know another thing too, is like I've gone into like meetings where I've, I walk in feeling like I showed up an hour late and that there's just conversations going around me that I'm not included in or invited to come into that space. And so I'm feeling very overwhelmed and lost. And um, it, I guess that, and I wasn't aware like that, that's how it's set up to make me feel that way. Um, so there's things that I'm still learning about how to navigate that process and I'm getting better about using my voice as an artist and speaking out and, and acknowledging kind of the, the harm that I've experienced uh, through these systems and advocating for myself uh, because it is a labor, it's emotional, it's a, a burden that I have to carry. Um, and so I'm, I'm looking to help create, you know, systems change and how 
organizations and systems work with artists of color um, to acknowledge kind of that that equity that would exist there in in the emotional labor that artists of color take on. And I love I pre really appreciate what you're saying because I think it your direct experience of it I think is a micro experience of like the system experience as well. Like I think the the bureau bureaucracies intended to almost create re recreate that experience of the transactional across the entire spectrum of particularly around infrastructure, right? Because I, I actually think that it's much easier for both capitalism and big capital civil projects that are some kinds some kinds of infrastructure, which are like the big highways or the the transit systems, whatever, to uh, operate in a transactional context rather than a relational context because there's no like I, I think what you're really demanding is that there needs to be a relationship built into the way the work happens rather than just purely transaction I don't think that uh, there's only start we're only starting to see some mechanisms where relationships can get created and like for example um, the Department of Transportation in Oakland um, one of the things they did as a small step was to, instead of just saying, hey, every time we are going to do a project somewhere in the city, um, let's put out our request for proposals, which we all know are sort of bureaucracy writ large, I mean, embodied, right, where uh, groups in the community that we might want to have help us figure out how to best navigate the dynamics of this project community have to apply and go through a whole process of putting the proposal together and all this work, right? That, that, and then what they said was like, we have to stop doing that. So instead we're gonna do like an open call once a year to, for all potential community-based groups to get um, to apply once to be part of a whole master, uh, like a, an overarching list that they can be called on during projects um, that are happening in different places. So that it's, a, it's trying to get into relationship with community-based artists and designers as well. In, in communities instead of having to do transactional work with them every single time. It, it's still transactional. I'm only saying this is a small step, but it at least it's getting into relationship with the groups in a different way that allows there to be a different kind of like impact on the work. And I'll just share from my, from my point of view, um, where I'm kind of seeing some national tre trends. Uh, that's a lot of the lens that I have. Um, I am seeing a little bit of this shift towards a bit more investment in relationships and the kinds of ways that like city departments, at least Jeremy are um, rethinking things like requests for proposals, which even just, you know, for me, even just dropping the, the lingo RFP is confusing and, and, you know, not everybody even knows what that means, let alone has the, the resources to keep you know, pumping out proposals, um, especially if you're a working artist and um, you're doing many other things. So I, I am, I think aside from Oakland's Department of Transportation, I'm, I am seeing that shift in some other places and that gives me a sense of hope. Joseph, you, um, in some of our earlier conversations as we were preparing this issue of Forward, we, you talked um, often about how you think about place and that, um, you know, there, there is a sort of a dominant narrative and understanding of place that is, um, that isn't, doesn't quite track with how you think about place, what place means, um, the significance of it. So I wonder if you, you all could share a little bit about um, what we see as some of the challenges and opportunities of, of sort of where like dominant culture understands place um, and then how you all are thinking about place in your work. What, is, what does place mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, oftentimes when I'm thinking about work and the built environment and, and this kind of space of architecture and design, uh, I often kind of start with how are we kind of defining community culture and place? And how is the project that, or the potential project related to the specific places that we'll be inevitably building building on? Uh, and so this is kind of a poor attempt to, for me to kind of define or, or think about what is an acknowledgement mean? And, and 
and by acknowledging place, acknowledging these uh, the, the communities that have historically called these places home, uh, uh, it, it is acknowledging a people. It's acknowledging where where you're building and where you're either kind of building uh, notions of capital around, uh, and so and that's that's a history. And so this kind of going back uh, and understanding that this is somebody's home uh, or it was a people's home and, and it's still considered a people's home. And so we need to inevitably acknowledge that. Also acknowledging that the kind of, the differences between places uh, going back to what the 1937 Housing Act has done is saying everything's the same. And, and, and we need to kind of break that, that, the, that idea of, uh, of, of what Western society has kind of coined. And I mean, this is all, even if we think about the context of kind of the, our architectural practice around the kind of modernization of air conditioning and all these things that have kind of broke down what indigenous knowledge has lifted up uh, is, is, is really kind of important to these notions around place. If we can cool and, and make the, the air inside of a building a temperate 65 degrees, we can live anywhere. And so then inevitably our architecture becomes placeless. And so we have to kind of rethink those nuances about where we're living, how we're living, and, and ways in which we're kind of acknowledging how we think about the communities that we want to be in community with. That makes me think, uh, Joseph, of like the, because I think almost, or I'm asking you, do you mean that in some ways, even the sort of more indigenous or native practices about uh, making places habitable often probably even require a different type of relationship with your neighbor that is different than the, I have a box and I can air condition it to, without having to like all my, you know, you, know, you have all these potential like negative externalities that aren't, just outsourced to outside of the walls of your house. Whereas like the different types of approaches, strategies, like, you know, co-joined walls or denser blocks of homes and things like that, just put into context a very different set of relationships you need in order to like make those strategies possible. Is that yeah, I mean, I, 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 inevitably, it's a breakdown of community. Uh, I, I would say if we're not acknowledging the places in which we're building, if we're not acknowledging the climates in which we're building, if we're not acknowledging the peoples that have that understand how to live. Uh, we're not we're not moving forward in a productive way. I, I, I mean, this is uh, maybe an overgeneralization, but when we think about the 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 subdivisions that could be nowhere USA right that subdivisions where you don't know your neighbors uh, and you don't need to rely on your neighbors because you're self-contained like all the, the this is where uh, a breakdown I think inevitably of society uh, has kind of gone uh, and so building back on the kind of social structures I would say I mean when when I was kind of working on on some housing projects this this ability to kind of see your neighbor and communicate and be able to kind of have those notions or, uh, or those kind of abilities to have conversations that aren't planned or scripted. Um, like this, is, this idea of building communities uh, can, can be reflected in um, the, the teepee encampments of how we kind of lived. I'm not saying we're gonna go back to teepees, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, but this, this idea of how do we kind of leverage technology as we kind of move forward and kind of in within the built environment uh, and and lift up spaces that build community rather than break down community. Angela, how do you think about place in your work? Oh, I think Jeremy was saying something. No, no, go for it. Sorry, <laughs> go for it. Uh, how do I think about place in my work? Um, I like to look at kind of the history of the place of the spaces that I'm working at, especially because I'm back home in my Dakota homelands. Um, that's an opportunity for me to reconnect. I think um, the importance of place for me as a Dakota woman, as a Dakota artist, um, I was... I grew up on a reservation in South Dakota and I didn't come back to Minnesota and I keep saying like coming back, but I never lived here. 
<laughs> till 2017. Um, and it was through a public art project opportunity is where um, I was able to reconnect with like my, my ancestral homelands and you know living kind of like a nomadic lifestyle for a number of years feeling like everything was very um temporal like coming here to minnesota coming back to where my ancestors are from i felt a real like blood memory connection to the land and it's something that's kind of indescribable like i felt like i was home which i never felt when i lived on the reservation and I think that connection to the land and to this place has empowered me as an artist. It strengthened my voice. You know, it strengthened my identity within you know who I am as a Dakota person, uh, my language journey. So just being back on my homelands, I think, has is a huge indicator of the that importance of place. And as a you know, a, coming from ancestors who were exiled from the state um, in 1862 it's part of that healing. And I think it's part of that historical healing, you know, that my ancestors endured. And for me to be able to be home and have that understanding of what they experienced to be like forced from their homelands, you know, I was really able to connect with what they had endured and, and knowing that I was a testament, just my presence is a testament to their strength and resilience. So yeah, it's very, uh, place is a big deal, big deal for me. And I like to incorporate that to my work because since I was separated from this land, I didn't know of the sacred spaces here in Minnesota because I was, you know, in a reservation community. And so now I get to like, learn these things that had been kind of kept from me growing up. So when I do projects, I like to explore the history of the land um, and, and use that information as part of the concepts of the work that I create. I appreciate the perspective um, of your own relationship to place. Um, I would love to bring in some of the questions that we're getting and, and feel free also attendees to add any questions that you have as we continue to move along the conversation. Um, Marion Cadora, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, uh, shared a great question and wants to know if you all can talk about situations when community members have different perspectives on a project that you're working on. Um, how have you dealt with community members having divergent perspectives? Because all of you are talking about, you know, really wanting to centralize community in the process. Um, and so what happens when community members don't agree on, on something? Yeah, it's it's a great uh, it's a great question because it inevitably happens, especially when you're talking about maybe larger projects that will have uh, systemic change within the community and that are inevitably going to have long term in terms of timeline impacts. So this housing project will be here for the next fifty years, eighty years, or however long. Um, and and I would say. One particular project working in uh, uh, on a reservation, a community man, member came up and and just said, "We need housing. We don't care what it looks like. We just need a roof over our heads. We don't have a safe place to go to at the end of the day. Just build it and build it as fast as you can, so that we can have uh, have shelter." Uh, and then another community member coming in and saying, "Well, we're trying to build something. We have been without housing." For the past 20, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, what does another six months look like? What does another eight months, a year look like? Um, if we can get housing that reflects our, our community, our culture, and is designed specifically for who for who we are. Um, and those are that that's those are real issues. Uh, people are facing housing insecurity, uh, housing justice issues. And so how do you kind of reconcile that um, and, and kind of uh, not necessarily change the minds of those that see the immediacy, but talk about how we can maybe hopefully afford uh, additional time to build housing that is sustainable, that is affordable, that is culturally relevant. Um, and, and, and I'd say those are hard conversations um, that we're hopefully going to, the, the end result will hopefully reflect the, the community. Um, and, and at times, 
uh, and, and this might be a question from leadership, right? And, and the community wants a housing that reflects who they are, that they can make their own and create a, a sense of uh, ownership of, of the project. And um, at times that can be a struggle. Um, I would just add that um, the work that the Zuni Youth Enrichment Project did in um, Zuni, New Mexico, um, where they worked with an artist committee to help them navigate the sort of questions about whether or not the siting of a new park that they wanted to build was the right one, where some folks were opposed to a park there, and some of the the idea, you know, that and some of the attendants sort of potential perceived or. They feared some of the negatives around a park of people hanging around or it being sort of not maintained or whatnot as, as compared to some other folks in the community who really felt that the young folks in the community really needed a place to, to have a, a place to recreate and exercise and hang out. And um, the artist committee that was involved was really central to that, to navigating that conflict because um, they did a lot, they were actually able to work in like multiple levels at the same time. So it wasn't just going around to say, hey, we want to mediate this conflict. It was about, let's also talk about how this is a cult opportunity for cultural manifesting like cultural space in the community in a different way, right? So that they were agents of holding multiple sort of possibilities of any kind of infrastructure rather than just the singular, right? Typically when you hire, when you go do an infrastructure project, it's let's hire a community engagement or public process or whatever you want to call it, consultant. And their one charge is to, you have to like go through the required number of community meetings to have people give input onto this one project. But it's never about, hey, let's have an open-ended conversation about possibility, about changing it, about what are the ways this can be adapted. And that artist community essentially is a really good placeholder for what it would mean to actually have um, in a lot of ways to be in relationship with the to culture bearers of the community to be part of a project because they were able to then go off and navigate that without um, sort of the forced procedural um, requirements of like community engagement. And, I, and I'll share a link to some more material about that in the, in the chat. I think I could just briefly share um, uh, my first public art project was at Bidea Makaska, which at the time was going through a name reclamation. And it was something that the there was opposing communities, you know, about that that change. And for me, when I as I was contemplating the language, the Dakota language that I would share at that site, um, one of the things like as a public artist and thinking about the public as a whole, um, I chose to incorporate a phrase it's a ohina ohina dead watik day which means this place will always be home and like that phrase is something that that both the native and the non-native audience could embrace you know and i was thinking about people that you know grew up around this lake and like learned how to ride their bike around this lake and they always knew it as its former name and so like to them like that this place, Minnesota, will always be home. And the same could be said for the Native people that were exiled from the state and are coming home to all be able to uh, embrace that phrase that is like kind of a universal for all of us that, who love that land and who love the lake. Um, so that's, that's one way that I handled that. I think we have time for one more question, maybe two. So I'm gonna combine two questions. Uh, we're getting a few questions about the, the dreaded RFP process and how we can reimagine that so that our spatial projects are not transactional and they're more relational. So the question is, um, um, how have these processes more, so there's a specific question, Jeremy, for you about how um, sort of the nitty gritty of how the the work in the Oakland yeah. DOT is moving to more relational. And then there's a broader question for everyone about, um, are there any equity issues if we are moving those processes um, away from open call? Yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, the, Liesl's question is great. I, um, I think what's important is that the city of Oakland's moving I, in some ways to itself as a whole, 
being more relational with artists and designers and community folks. So it's not just in DOT. So the latest arts and culture sort of plan, so to speak, for the city really, um, call, which is really a framework plan, not an implementation plan, but really calls for a city of belonging and, and really situates um, culture bearers and community to be part of the way uh, governance actually happens in the city and, and process and implementation of pr priorities. So there uh, to, and I'm sure Mallory, you can say a lot, um, say about this, but the cultural uh, strategists and residence program is another example of being deeply in relationship with folks rather than transactionally involved with them. So I think the DOT example is a good one of a step away from the purely transactional in the right direction. And the city itself is I think moving from the, the department level down as well to be directly in relationship. And I think maybe as those things get more and more sophisticated and, and grow over time, you can sort of meet in the middle where you're really having the um, a direct thread right between the department implementation of you know their priorities you know bureaucratic system right uh, through their cultural strategies that they've been in relationship with through to uh, a, a pool of community-based organizations that they are um, sort of already deciding ahead of time that they want to be working with when it comes down to the actual project implementation level. So that's really exciting to see and, and want to see what, where that goes eventually. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'll just maybe ask each of you to share uh, sort of the one thing as we, as we head uh, to close our conversation today. If you could maybe just share one thing that um, is really giving you energy right now in, in your work in art design and justice, what's kind of um, keeping you inspired? to kind of dive in. I mean, uh, I think what is inspiring me is, is really all the work, all the good work that is out there that needs to be done. Uh, I mean, I look at uh, all the development work happening, both kind of uh, on reservation and off reservation in urban Indian communities, uh, like all that is moving the conversation in a direction that I think we need to be moving. What does a urban Indian housing project look like that is being funded through Nahasda, right? How are we using uh, block grant funding that has been allocated to on-reservation, off-reservation, and to be challenging the systems that were put into place to kind of suppress and, and push back in ways that we're developing our capacity uh, as indigenous peoples to, to kind of use those systems that have historically been there to suppress us, to lift us up. Uh, and if we can kind of continue to build that internal capacity, both within natives who are working in Indian country and non-natives that are working in Indian country to, to be serving and lifting up in, in, these, in these ways that are, are, are serving our communities, I think that's that's where we can we can uh, find hope and, and and find ways of of doing the work, doing the good work. I've noticed a recurrent theme of healing in a lot of the work that I do, and themes around water. Um, so those are those are the the elements that are giving me motivation and kind of being on my own healing journey and sharing that through my art to make it okay for other people to pursue theirs in whatever form shape that looks like. Um, I think that's, there's a strength that comes out of it. And that's like what that resilience looks like is, is pursuing healing and breaking cycles of intergenerational trauma. Um, and the, yeah, the strength that it takes to pursue healing. So I see that coming out a lot in my work. Um, I am inspired by some of the young people whose work I've been following through um, groups like um, Public Matters in LA who work with young people to really be involved in, you know, uh, really directly confronting sort of the bureaucratic standards around, say, 
uh, you know, street uh, traffic calming in neighborhoods and communities and the, the way that's been a, a pathway for some young folks to really grow into this, these roles and these careers. I think that's a really important uh, wave of folks coming up soon or not soon, already here. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you all for giving us your seeds of inspiration as we close out today's conversation. Um, appreciate all of your time, attentiveness of our audience and all your great questions. And I'm going to hand it over to Teresa to close us out. Thank you, Mallory and everyone. Um, great conversation. I wish we could keep it going. I wanted to Thank you, and then bring attention to the issue of forward. Um, it's incredibly robust, great case studies and writing in there. Um, in addition to a toolkit, which if you haven't checked out the toolkit, it's really um, has so much depth of practical information that are answering and helpful to many of the questions that I'm seeing come up as a way to kind of get more resources there. So please check that out. Also just encourage you to check out the public art now section of forward, which was curated by Mary Bordeaux. Um, great examples of work by native public artists really rethinking um, the concept of public art um, through their lens and through their own work. And we will have a conversation with Mary and some of those artists coming up later this summer. So look for that and make sure you're on our newsletter and checking things out. Um, and then finally, you know, feel free to reach out to Forecast, reach out to myself or anyone on our team, um, shoot me an email or give me a call to, to further these conversations or talk about how this kind of work could happen in your community. I included a little bit about our thoughts around RFPs and RFQs and, <laughs> and how that works. And that's just one sort of shift in the way of um, thinking and honoring and acknowledge the labor that artists put towards this kind of work and what they're, the value of their ideas and their creativity. So um, thank you so much for being here. And I look forward to you coming back again for our next conversation. And thanks to all our speakers. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.